I've excelled in advanced physics, biology and astronomy. A tourist is someone who travels across the ocean only to be photographed sitting next to their boat. I have no intention of being a tourist. Yes, that's right. It's a science fiction rating Bill. system. Yeah, none of us are tourists. We are fully interacting members. Uh, whatever. We watch films and we're going to talk about them. That's what this is about. I mean, um, the, we're not transsexual time travellers either, are we, though? Spoilers. No, we're not transsexual time travellers. <laughs> um, I don't know about you two. No, 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 I'm not. But we are interactive. That's what we are. Right. Um, and we're here to talk about <laughs> predestination. And I'm here as ever with Chris Redding. Bonjour. Hello. How are you, Chris? Yeah, not too bad. Just uh, getting out of a cough. I've got a little cough oh. suite on the go. We're in business. Good. And Sam Draper? Guten Morgen. Guten Morgen. Internet problems, <laughs> you said. Yeah, they're coming out this afternoon. Good. Is it in the area? Uh, Is it just you? I don't know. It happened a few weeks ago. And then they're like, oh, we fixed it. And then it wasn't fixed. And you know, like it takes forever because you have to yeah. go to the internet people and then they go to BT. And... Oh, but um, yeah, so if I vanish... Yeah. Or if I sound like shit, that's what's going on. But, you know. <laughs> well, my name is Alex Humphrey. I'm often plagued with internet problems. Um, Not and, lately, though. No, no, we've been all right. I see it. Yeah. I literally, the, the key to it, don't do me, I'll touch wood. Uh, I literally <laughs> sit next to the router now. That's my new, <laughs> I've taken over the living room. I just sit right next to the router. That seems to work. So Can't that's good. my... Uh, you, your priorities yep, are right. Yep, I may be irradiating myself, but... <laughs> but for a good cause. <laughs> it's for a good cause. Uh, yeah, so this is the final of our uh, 2014 films, five years ago now. It, uh, it's weird, isn't it? Those films don't seem five years ago. Did they seem five years ago to you? Uh, Interstellar definitely didn't. No. That seemed more recent. I remember that coming out, definitely. And I remember Under yeah. the Skin coming out as well. Like, yeah. These years and have been I whipping by recently, though, haven't they? Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it's true. Oddly, I remember this because um, for my website, they were emailing me a lot about this film because I think it was quite a small release and they couldn't really... They wanted to drum up as much kind of press for it as possible. Hmm. Uh, so, yeah. I would not heard of it before you brought it for the podcast. There you go. Well, yes. Yeah. Uh, the film we're talking about is Predestination, uh, written and directed by the uh, Spierig brothers, who did Daybreakers. Did anyone see that? Nope. nope. It's the vampire film with Ethan Hawke, where the world, everyone is basically a vampire now. Humans are the minority, vampires mm. are the majority. It's, it's all right, it's interesting. Uh, Winchester, which was a story... Um, that was a big one. That was like the, the that's about the Winchester Mystery House, which is a real yeah. House. I heard that one. Hel- yeah. Helen Mirren, wasn't it? That was yeah, that Helen Mirren. Yeah. It's a flawed film, but it's an interesting subject. But it's a flawed mm. film. Uh, they also did Jigsaw, which was the recent reboot of uh, Saw. Saw. Um, and uh, more interesting, it's based on a short story "All You Zombies" by Robert A. Heinlein, the mm. uh, Starship Troopers man. Yeah, we have him to thank for Starship Troopers. Um, and it's very closely based on that story um, I read. In fact, there's very little that is different to it, which is very, which is kind of interesting. Um, yeah. But the the synopsis, as as you, I've tried to have a stripped back synopsis, although I, although Sam's already done a spoiler. Sorry. That's all right. Uh, Ethan <laughs> Hawke plays a time traveling agent desperately trying to stop a deranged bomber murdering hundreds of people. That's as stripped back as I could. Say the f- really the fizzle bomber, which is the worst name for a, a the terrorist. Fizzle I've bomber, heard. In, indeed, the fizzle bomber, and that is my part one. Burnt by the fizzle bomber. Um, what were you thinking of that why name? Why called the fizzle bomber? Oh, I, I do have a bit of a reason why it's called the fizzle bomber. Do you want to hear it? Yeah. Uh, it's not in the original short work. Uh, it's not in the, but it's obviously they said it was obviously put into a, a, for additional conflict. But in Heinlein's original story, there is reference to the Fizzle War of 1963 and that the war fizzled out, or the war fizzled. The story then explains the bomb with New York's number on it didn't go off, so presumably the war never happened. So I don't know if maybe they're using... fizzled out. Yeah, they're using the idea of the bomb starting a war and using that name. Mm. I don't know. It just doesn't sound very good, does it? No. Every time I said it, you're like, that's a bit silly. But they do <laughs> comment on that, don't they? Throughout the film, they say it's a stupid name. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Mm. Well, anyway, we start on the voiceover at the start, which is a quote that um, it appears like three times during the film, uh, which is Ethan Hawke's character, who's called the barkeep. 
And he says, what if I could put him in front of you, the man that ruined your life? If I could guarantee that you'd get away with it, would you kill him? Uh, and then we have this kind of weird, it's quite a cryptic opening, isn't it? Hmm. There's kind of like a basement, there's a bomb, there's people shooting. Uh, it kind of looks like a film, like an old fashioned film noir, doesn't it? It's a bit weird. And then a, someone's face gets blown up. Isn't that before the guy in the bar? Yes, yeah. that's what, no, but you hear that voiceover saying that. Oh, uh, right, yeah, sorry, yeah. 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 Uh, and then he's in bandages. It's weird because the bandages really reminded me of uh, time crimes. Times, yeah. c- yes, time crimes. Yeah, which I kind of think this film's got quite a lot in common with time crimes. I would say. Yeah. 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 Um, and then you kind of learn, as you said, that the fizzle bomber is a bomber who is uh, been perpetrating crimes throughout history, blowing up these places, and that this kind of from the at the beginning we just know that there's an organisation. And they're trying to stop him. That's kind of all we're told, isn't it? Hmm. It's not. It is quite a f- kind of shady, uh, a shady opening. Um, it's 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 sort of like shady to the point of not really making much sense, does it? You don't really know what's going on at all, do you? Not really. really? No, no. It's all just you know. Yeah. I mean, Ethan Hawke obviously has massive. Recon- he has reconstructive surgery. You see him with a moustache, and then you kind of get the idea that you've gone back in t- back to his first mission or something, don't you? There's a mm. there's something yeah. that kind of makes you think that definitely. Yeah. And then we have the title, and we're kind of in to part two, which is the unmarried mother, where he is actually a barman. Mm. Um, mm. And it's kind of odd because it's uh, from this bit of the film, it's kind of not really what I thought the film was because it's no, not me at all. Yeah. It's mainly the character of the unmarried mother, who is Sarah... Uh, Snook. Sarah Snook, thank you. Mm. And it's her basically telling Ethan Hawke a big, long story of her past. Um, yeah. What did we think about this? What do you think about this whole... I mean, we'll go into it in bigger detail, but as a <clears throat> kind of narrative setup. So I, when mean- I first saw it, I saw it in, like, I'd come... It had already started. It was on the TV. I came oh. on at this point. So oh. it was like, it was quite interesting. And uh, I hadn't seen the opener. And when I saw the opener this time, I actually was surprised at how much they do give you, given that I know the story. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Mm. So you were almost time traveling in watching the film. <laughs> I thought, well, you would, this you've film... gone ahead and gone back and then watched the beginning. The film's so muddled and in different orders that I thought, well, let's just do my own edit of that. Oh, <laughs> yeah, <nice>. okay. <laughs> that's the filmmaker in you, there, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he just can't stop directing. Yeah, that's very interesting. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Um, I um, I've I thought this was perhaps the strongest bit of the film, right? Um, but also it's very unevenly paced. This film, isn't it? And mm. l- like, it, it feels like one film becomes a different film. Yeah, and also. Like we can spoil the end, can't we? Everyone. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to do spoilers on this, obviously. Yeah. I mean, the real problem with this start bit is that the the boy that Ethan Hawke is talking to is so clearly a woman in drag. Yes. That it kind of ruins. Uh, yeah. What they're going for a bit, doesn't it, with this whole setup? Yeah. I no, I do agree. I mean, she took what was it? Uh, she was four hours every morning in makeup to to have that transformation to look like a man. But as soon but she as she doesn't look like an actual no, transsexual, is she. She just looks like. A, I mean, I was. Yeah, I, I thought you know that's a woman, and yeah, didn't click when she was a small child. But as soon as she becomes the actual actress, you're like, well, that's clearly yeah, who sat with Ethan Hawke, isn't it? So mm. yeah, it, I, I agree with you. I think it is a bit of a. I thought it would be that she was a woman living as a man, not as in yeah. as in transsexual, not yeah. with the right bits as it because of how poor the. Yeah, because she just looked like yeah. a, a woman with short hair wearing men's clothes. Yeah, completely. It, yeah, she's yeah. probably just too young when they shot it. Like she hasn't got enough wrinkles and stuff, has she? She doesn't look as mm. haggard. She needs. No, to that's be. true. Yeah, no, that's true. And also the clothes she's wearing, it just looks like she's wearing kind of bulky clothes. It doesn't look like she has mm. like a. Yeah, I, I know what you, you mean. If you cast someone with more of like a like an Ellen Page face, then mm. you could have got away with it a bit better. But she doesn't look very boyish at all, does she? So it's no. You know, she's not got a boy shape, a face shape. Actually, she just looks like a girl. <laughs> basically, no. even no, as no. a man. But yeah. no, I do. No, I agree with you with that. It Jamie Lee I'd... Curtis could have done this. Yeah, yeah. Mm. That'd be, that'd yes, be cool. they yeah. probably should have gone for a more um... androgynous look. Yes, an, an, accent, an androgynous yeah. actress. Uh, yeah. that would have got away with it a bit Sigourney better. Weaver. Yeah. Yeah. 
But I mean, I think they went with someone unknown because they thought it would be more interesting to have someone you didn't have any preconceptions of. I doubt they could get Sigourney Weaver. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, well, well the, the plot is basically that um, the unmarried mother, who is, yes, a man, but really, sadly, doesn't look too much like a man, uh, she bets Ethan Hawke's barkeep that she has the most crazy story mm. that he's ever heard, which he, he, the story opens with when I was a little girl. And he does this really silly kind of shocked face, doesn't he? Yeah. That's kind of a bit of lame. He was a bit of a lame bit of act. He's like, huh? What? I mean, um, he's crap all the way through, isn't he? He's not a good actor. What do no, you think? Do you like him as an actor? I didn't mind him in this, but no, I, is he? He's not a great what, actor, is he? What did you think, Chris? No, he's got that kind of. Um, uh, I don't know. It's, there's there's a lot of actors like him. That that it's. I'm trying to think of someone who's similar. He just looks um, like he's acting to me. Mm, yeah, I don't and he's always anything. quite samey as well. I would say. Yeah. Um, I mean, I haven't seen all the before films, before Sunset, before all those films, which are his kind of most famous yeah. things. But, I mean, a lot of that was improvised, so he probably is being himself in those. He's, but, um, he's crap in The Purge. That's all I know. <laughs> yeah. No, I know what that, you that mean. That film's not very good, though, is it? No. <clears throat> no. Bill Paxton's um, a little bit like him in style, I think. Like, mm. it's in line delivery, but... Yeah, I think you're right. Bill Paxton yeah, that's is, what you but... mean. Um, you buy it from Bill Paxman a bit more, there. Yeah. They're support actors. They're not leading men. Is that what we're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Um, hmm. Yeah. Like it kind of made sense. You know how Ethan Hawke wasn't really around for like twenty years. Yeah. That kind of made sense, didn't it? Because mm. he's not yeah. very good. No, that's true. Matt no. Dillon's a bit diff- similar to him as well. Yes, Matt Dillon is very similar to him. It, he's quite good in Gattaca, isn't he? Thinking about it. Mm. He's he's a bloke yeah. in that, isn't he? He's yeah. not bad in that. No, he's not bad in that. Hmm. He's yeah. He's an odd one. He's he, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, you're right. He doesn't really. Uh... And because really, like this film really is hinging on him a lot, isn't it? Especially the, the final third. Mm. He's got a lot to do to carry it, and I just don't think he pulls it off, does he? Really, mm. but um, no. I mean, anyway. I thought it was an engaging enough story that he didn't need to be great. But uh, yeah, I suppose. But I agree with you. He's not. Yeah, he's not massively strong. Mm. Um, plot wise, we find out that in the 1940s. 1943, I think, to be exact, uh, mm-hmm. that uh, the unmarried mother was left at an orphanage, uh, was named Jane Doe. She was brought up in the orphanage and she always felt different and she was good at fighting. She was very clever, but she was always kind of outside of everyone else. Uh, she was never interested in sex. She, was, she didn't fit a kind of feminine stereotype. Um, and then we move to this kind of next element, uh, part three, the space cores, and Noah Taylor shows up, who I do think is a good actor. I do always like a bit of Noah Taylor. Um, mm. He's uh, it's his third appearance as a supervisor of a time traveller. <laughs> wow! <laughs> yeah. Why are you getting typecast as that? It's yeah, strange so, thing because he's in Vanilla Sky and The Edge of Tomorrow. So yeah, three time traveling supervisor roles. How old is that? <laughs> That's pretty <laughs> And they're all spaced out. It's 2001. Uh, oh, and Edge of Tomorrow was 2014. So, yeah, they're obviously really... Uh, we need that time-travelling supervisor guy. Get Noah Taylor on the phone. Um, he's one of those good actors that, like, he's got a very distinct face, hasn't he? When he pops up, you're like, oh, that guy. Yeah. He's, one, one of those, that, he's one of those that guys, isn't he? That's what he is. He's mm. that guy. Safe hands. Yeah, but, yeah, he is safe hands, yeah. yeah. Um, he turns up and he tells... Uh, he says to Jane that she can go on a programme... Uh, It's now the 60s, isn't it? And it's a programme for women who will be kind of companions to astronauts. Um, And I Mm. thought this was a really cool, interesting idea. I almost thought, was this real? Like, it almost feels like something that might have actually happened, don't you think? Mm. Yeah. I think it's still dirty in Scientology. (laughs) (laughs) Like, I thought it's kind of like, especially given that it's the 60s, the idea that like, oh, what, we've got these astronauts... They're like these amazing, great men. Oh, well, they're not going to be able to survive up in space without sex. And they've got we better time get some... to go to bars. Yeah, we better get some women up there with them to kind of have sex with them. But they have to be really clever women and really physically uh, able women, which kind of makes sense, I guess, because they've got to go in space. I think if you, if, if you had to point to a bit of this film that tips you to, after the fact that it's a short story written in the 60s, it's this, isn't it? Is the... <laughs> Is the bit that says, "Oh yeah, right, it's a it's a Robert Heinlein story." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's it's a very strange. I mean, it, it 
yeah, because up until now the film's been kind of looks quite normal, but when they're in yeah. that facility <laughs> wearing those like helmets, aren't they? And they're wearing all these kind of sixties clothes and stuff. And yeah. I thought it was quite well realized this bit. I liked it. Um, what did you think? Do you think it was a good idea? Um, well, it, no, it's batshit crazy the idea, <laughs> but it's it's uh, something you've not heard before, is it? And yeah. the look was all right. It reminded me of. Have you seen the TV show Legion? Oh yeah, yeah, it did look like Legion. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the Legion looks a lot better than this, but mm. that kind of look, yeah. I like it. It's a good look. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Kind of retro, but future like, retro. retro. Future. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Mm. But it's during this training uh, that the doctors, who'd never been, um, Jane had never been really medically tested before, and uh, a doctor kind of looks her over. Uh, and finds out that there's maybe something more going on with her than mm. she knew, and at that point, Noah Taylor dumps her from the uh, from the program, but she doesn't know this. She believes that it's uh, because she had a fight with another uh, another person, doesn't she? Yeah. So we're kind of now really getting to the kind of the transitioning, the kind of transsexual element of this story, the transgendered bit. Mm. Um, which is very interesting, I thought. I thought it was to have this as an element here, although obviously it's important to uh, create the kind of paradox. Mm. I also thought it was quite a well done uh, look at that, you know, uh, transgendered people and at kind of that kind of the transition between a man and a woman stuff. Well, did you think it was well handled or did you think it was a bit like shoehorned in? Yeah, I thought it was well handled, and I think the overriding reason it's there is quite interesting. Like the actual, we'll get to mm. the end of the story and what it actually all means. Mm. Um, but if also, if you look into it, it's a little bit derogatory because of that reason as well. So I'll yeah 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 I'll, I'll we're probably a bit too early to bring that up. That's what I was going to say. Is that like I, like you? I think it's a good. It's like a. It is a, like a quite a good you know portrayal of this sort of thing but then yeah the story kind of works against what it's showing you yeah, mm. yeah um, you which mean. i think is what chris saying like it by the resolution to the explanation as to why she is transgender is sort of a you know again a nice un- undoing the good work yeah. it did by bringing it up in the first yeah. place you know what i mean mm. yeah. but i mean i guess that's uh you know the, the a lot of times things like science fiction and horror uh, will obviously touch on subjects that other films, yes. you know, a, a film would do it very, another film, a drama about uh, someone transitioning would be very blatant in how they Star handle Trek's it. Star Trek's done this a few times quite successfully. Pardon? Um, Star Trek's done this sort of story a few yeah. times quite successfully. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think it's, um, what, uh, what I mean is that though science fiction and, and horror can do this, but in a way, there has to be an added element that is the science fiction or is the horror. Yeah. And as you yeah. both just said, sometimes that can almost undo the yeah. kind of reality think, of it. <clears throat> I see they're not intentionally tripping themselves up, but like a braver story would be that if she was, she was transgender and it does factor into the story, but it isn't the actual like MacGuffin mm. that, that, that the yeah. whole paradox relies on, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. No, no, true. No, that's true. Um, Basically, plot-wise, it's that she she gets thrown out of the Space Corps. Uh, Noah Taylor turns up again and kind of hints at this time travel super organisation. But you, again, you're mm. not really sure. He kind of just says, I'm recruiting the best people. But then at that point, she meets a man, falls in love, gets pregnant, has the baby. But when she comes around, the surgeon tells her that in, her internal setup is different and that she had two full sets of... Uh, genitalia and organs basically completely didn't she because she could have the baby as well and but that they've all... sorry also this bit they they very carefully don't show her face today of the of the, of the bloke yes which yes. was such a red flag for the story wasn't yes it? <laughs> yeah the fact that you don't see the man she falls in love with and also yeah. i mean to be honest at this point i hadn't seen a film and at this point when they started saying oh, you know, you've got these, you've had a baby and there's these two, you've got two sets of organs and all this. I was a little bit like, okay, I can kind of see where this is going now. Mm. Mm. I, I, found this... I, I didn't Go. think that it was her falling of herself. I thought it was Ethan Hawke. Bef- mm. I, I thought before surgery, like it was... Yeah. 
and that's why I showed the bit at the start of the film that, you, that his face would have changed from the person she fallen in love with. So I didn't guess it properly, but it's very... I mean, I guess it's not a bad thing. It's it's signposting it, is it? Just it was very... No. You know, it's got to, I suppose, isn't it? Can't I mean, it, show you her. So, and also the the other option is to wait till the end and have a a much bigger reveal, which you probably would have been like, we, we probably would have all been a bit like, oh, okay, it was that. Like, yeah. it's it's almost better to kind of eke it out now. I think. Yeah, yeah. Did you see it coming, Chris, when you watched I, it the first? I don't think I did properly, and then, but what I found like super interesting is like the amount of information you was given at like. In mm-hmm. a in a sort of a technical <clears throat> sense, how you tell that sort of story and how yeah. you give a certain amount of information, because even by just having her having a shot where both of their faces are in shot or one is looking at the other, it mm-hmm. kind of undoes mm-hmm. the whole thing. Yeah, and especially when she has a sex change and becomes that person that she already knows. Like, yeah, it's mental. Like it doesn't yeah. work. Like on paper, that does not work, but the way it's kind of drip, drip fed yeah. on screen, it does, mm. which is really no, I interesting. Agree. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now we're in the part five, an offer you can't refuse. She's now, tr- so she's now transitioned. She's now a man, which I thought actually, I mean, I thought that scene where she was like saying her name, where she's saying, oh, hi, my name is Jane. I thought that was actually quite a, I think she's, I mean, I think she does perform these bits quite well. I think it's quite a good performance from her. Yeah, yeah. Like you say, I mean, it's not her fault. They, the makeup isn't solid enough, but I think she performs, she she puts across the kind of the difficulties and the alienation you would feel if you Definitely. were in the wrong body. I mean, I do And think also, like, that. it's normally people who, who transition do it by choice, whereas she's had this forced on her, which yeah. is also, a, a, you know, another weird little wrinkle in the story, I suppose. Mm. That it? must so, have happened yeah. in the 60s, and, you know, previous generations must have been forced to do various things. Well, yeah, like you say, I mean, it would the doctors would have just gone, right, we'll just do this then. You know, mm. you've got these, these things, we'll, yeah. we'll yeah. just make yeah. a decision. There wouldn't have been as much a kind of consent, would there? Um, mm. You know, so, yeah. I mean, it's interesting because... Um, I've got written down here that uh, Ethan Hawke uh, said that the transgender issues are not the focal point of the film to him, but rather the narrative is relevant to all people. There's something about predestination that actually does get to identity for me. So his kind of opinion was it wasn't really about that, uh, and it was more just about your own identity, I guess. Um, but mm-hmm. I think I think there is something about I think the transgender element is important in this. Um and as a way of examining it and looking at it, I think it's quite a good way of doing it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I definitely think it's it does more in that direction than as a as a metaphor for identity as a whole. I don't buy yeah. that at all. Yeah, no. So, yeah, true. Um, really, this so this last section is the end of the unmarried mother's story. So basically, he now as a man living as um, just what, what does he call himself, John? I think he does call himself John, doesn't he? Yeah, John, John Doe and Jane John Doe and Jane Doe. So now he, he yeah. takes on the role of the unmarried mother writing confessionals uh, for magazines because he has this kind of insight into the women's yeah. angle, which I guess, you know, fair enough. Um, and this is when we kind of loop back as far as the script is. And Ethan Hawke gives that opening line again and says that uh, he could put the person that ruined... Uh, John's life, which is the man that got her pregnant, uh, he could, he could, they could go back in time, find that person, and then John could then kill that person, and I guess undo what had happened is what he's proposing. Is he? Yeah. So, like at, at this point, does Ethan Hawke know that he is the fizzle bomber? Uh, no. But Ethan Hawke at this point is setting up the paradox. To get but, Jane and John to get but together. But why though? Who who does he think she's going back to kill? Yeah, isn't it just the impetus to get her him to go back, as it were? But what's his reason though? Like why? To else they, else he won't exist because if Jane and John don't have sex, then then Jane doesn't exist. Right. Yeah, but he's trying to break the whole paradox. <laughs> He's trying to break it. Yeah. Is he trying to break it, though? I think he's trying to reinforce it. Yeah, maybe he is. Because there's quite a few lines where Noah Taylor says, like, oh, you've got to stay on mission. Like, the mission is the most important thing. Well, hang on. Noah Taylor sent sent him 
what has no what has what has the, the guy done Noah Taylor done? What's his mission for Ethan Hawke? He he <laughs> he perpetuates the, the yeah paradox. paradox. Yeah, I think he wants to, they're trying to create an agent out of time, aren't they? Who's got no yes. ties. Yeah. yeah. So I think the first mission is to create that agent. So yeah. the first mission is to make the paradox, and yeah. then it and then it is implied, jumping ahead, that Noah Taylor is actually okay with the fizzle bomber existing because the fizzle that by right, the end yeah, so i feel that's what the implication is so ethan hawks in the bar because noah taylor is saying to him you've got to send her back to fall in love with herself yeah yes yeah right okay yeah so they, they first must sense. thus create like you say they must the perfect temporal agent is a person who has no ties to anything mm. um yeah. because i guess you assume when Noah Taylor goes to uh, Jane and says, oh, I'm recruiting people, maybe back then he had recruited a few people and tried it out and it didn't really work. So yeah. he needed to find someone who could be exist outside of time, yeah. I guess. I mean, <laughs> we're doing a lot of work. It is a short story. I mean, yeah. <laughs> we're doing a lot of extra work, um, you know, I guess. But, um, but anyway... They have this weird little fizzle, this little fiddle case, which is a time machine. Which that, I mean, I like it, but it's, that's a quite an old-fashioned idea of a time machine, isn't it? Yeah, I quite like it, the effect it does, though, when they yeah jump. Yeah, I like that. But the but carrying around a fizzle fiddle case, it's a bit. Of a, it's not non. It's not like a briefcase. It would you'd kind of stand out, wouldn't you, if you had that <laughs> carrying that around yeah. during not very discreet. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, he jumps from the forties to the eighties. You assume it's not. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. not very. Dis- anyway, um, and uh, we jump. They they jump to 1963, and at this point, there's basically just a big load of dialogue about the temporal agency and stuff. Which mm. it's the kind of the first time the film does that thing bad films do, where it's just one person talking and explaining yeah. everything, isn't it? And it's fine. But he does just try and jam in a lot of like the explanation. Mm. Uh, so yeah, the the temporal agency is in nineteen eighty five. That's where the headquarters are. There's eleven agents who prevent crime before it takes place. Mm. Uh, you can't have a big time disruption footprint uh, because you can't. Uh, <laughs> you can only travel fifty three years uh, of point zero, which is the invention of time travel, which is 1981 for some strange reason. Well, I think that makes um, sense. Oh no, but why is, I like no, I mean, I meant why is 1981 the invention of time travel? Oh, well, cause it is. I guess they just worked it out then. <laughs> mm, yeah. I think though you could tell a really interesting story with the idea that, cause I think it isn't, it tw- I've got it here, 2034, they can go forward to a 1928, then go back to, and that's as far as they can go. Isn't oh, it? That's oh I thought it meant they the, couldn't go any further than the age of if you made a time machine at 81. Do you know what I mean? So if time machines no, were invented could... in 81, in, mm. in our lifetime, you could go as far as this minute now. Oh, right. You couldn't oh. go. Yeah. No, no. That, no that, what they say is you can only go 53 years or in, in either direction. Yeah. Uh, um, I don't think it does mean that. No. I... It, it, it does mean that. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. You can only travel 50 years of zero point, which is the invention of time travel, right, okay. which is 1981. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. So you can I must have got go... this from somewhere. I like my I've way better. down here, but... <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, they could go into yeah. the deep, deep future, right? Oh, no. Cause, well, yeah. No, they only get as far as 2034. Yeah, they've just put an arbitrary number on it. Yeah, 50. they have just put... Yeah, it is just an arbitrary My idea is better. Yeah. Um... Yeah. Can I just shout out a book while we're at this little bit? Go for um, it. I just read a book called The, the Gone Holy World. Bible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, no. no. Oh, dear. <laughs> We've gone that way. The podcast yeah, has I gone just think way. we need to just look to God. You know, in this instance. <laughs> All this science fiction is just taking yeah. us away from the true message I mean, of the if Lord. I mean, if we look at Revelations, I'm sure. <laughs> <we're looking. laughs> no, um, I just read a book called The Gone World okay. by Tom Svetelich. Hmm. And I, I, it's going to be a film, without a doubt. Uh, it's very similar to this. It's a time travel book. Um, but the idea in that book is that they, they, they discover time travel and they're jumping into the future mm. and they find the end of the world. Like they find the world, everyone's been crucified and dying. Okay. And then as they keep jumping, this, t- this end of the world is getting closer and closer to now. 
Oh. And there's like a, a murder mystery going on, and there's like a cult who wants the end of the world to come to this. It's a brilliant book, but I just want to mention it to anyone who's interested. Gone World, Tom Svetlich, much better than this film. And I want to, re- when this becomes a film, because it will, I'm going to refer back to this clip and go, yeah. I said it. I said it first. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, carry on. Cool. Would you like a quiz at this point? Yeah. Okay. I mean, we're quite into the film now. So I've got like, it's kind of, I've got a quiz. So this is the, so the setup is there are question categories, right? Mm. And the answer will either be, will be one of the four years that are in this film. So 1943, 1963, 1975, and 1985. So that's what the answer will be, one of those four things. Right. Okay? Yeah. But we'll jump about in the questions. Okay. You see what I mean? Nice. Yeah, I'm like predestined it. to win this quiz, Sam. Well, <laughs> do you want to know what the categories that we're going to jump about in are? Go on, then. So you've got Best Film Oscar Winner, mm. Prices... Which is quite a vague one. Nice. This is brilliant. You need a board up. You need to make a big board made. I'm top one ten, up. top ten baby names. Nice. <laughs> Notable <laughs> books from the year. Yeah. Uh, cost of a Super Bowl ad. Super Bowl ad. Yeah. And nice. news, which you know, it's it's mainly about. Uh, oh, I don't know if I should tell you. Uh, mainly about inventions. The All news right. section. Right. So, okay. okay. So I like it. Right. Who wants to go first? <laughs> Well, I'll go first because okay. Chris is right. definitely so, to win. So. Okay, so we're in Best <laughs> Film Oscar winner. So I'm going to give you the name of the film and remember yeah. the answer will be one of those, one of those years. years. Right, right, so right. The Godfather Part 2. Uh, 73. Do you mean 75? 75. 75, yes. sorry, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He gets that okay. wrong. Yeah, he no, he gets choices. it. Oh. Um, uh, <laughs> right, News. Kodak introduced the Instamatic camera. Mississippi physician James D. Hardy performed the first successful lung, lung transplant. Is that 43, 63, 75 or 85? Is this me? Chris. Um, yes, you, Chris. I would say 65, wanna... 63. Yes, it is 63. Yep. Okay. Uh, Sam, baby names. Mm. Uh, Lisa, Mary, Susan, Karen, Linda, Michael, John, David, James, Robert. 43, 63, 75 or 85? 85. No. That, <sighs> I'm not going to tell you what year that was though. Okay. Uh, Chris, prices. Uh, price of a gallon of gas. This is all American. No. Uh, 53 cents. Price of a movie ticket, $2. One ounce of gold, $139.29. Is that 43, 63, 75 or 85? 75. Ah, oh, yes. Well done. Uh, Sam, notable yeah. books. Uh, the Eagle Has Landed by Jack Higgins and Shogun by James Clavell. <laughs> what, was the, what was the first one, sorry? The Eagle Has Landed. Is that 43, 63, 75 or 85? And Shogun? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh... Is The Eagle Has Landed a war one? Let's go 63. It's 75. Oh, oh shit, I shouldn't, space shouldn't have told you. I thought Eagle has landed with space, to be honest. But... Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, right, Chris. Uh, best Oscar winner, Mrs. Minerva. Fuck knows. 43, uh, 63, 75 or 85? 43. Uh, yes. Got to be on that. Uh... Can we just listen if Chris is like doing like a thump noise before these? Is he going? Is he travelling through time to get the answers? Is that getting... No, I'll, I don't have to yeah. do it every time. I've just got his answers. I went back right, and just okay. got the day. I did it once. Yeah. I, I, gave, I, sent, I emailed them to him after the show. I'm going to get it out of his bin <laughs> later. And he's, yeah, yeah. He's time travelled to when I printed them at my work computer and he's taken yeah. them off the printer. No, I'll just go through your bin tonight. Twice. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, right, news, Sam. The Titanic Rick. was found 370 miles off Newfoundland. <clears throat> the plastic thingy that saves hot pizza from the top of the box was invented by Carmelina Vitali. 43, 63, 75, 85. 85. Yes. Well done. It's been 100 years. Uh, right. <laughs> Chris. <laughs> Cost of a Super Bowl ad, $107,000. <clears throat> 43, 63, 75 or 85? 75. Yes. Oh, he's doing very well. Damn it. 
Doing very well. Uh, right. I'm not going to say the categories. I'm sure you know the categories now. Right, Sam. Uh, Amadeus. Uh, 85. Yes. Well done. Uh, Chris. Uh, Jessica, Ashley, Jennifer, Amanda, Sarah, Michael, Chris, Topher, Matthew, Joshua, Daniel. <laughs> Topher? Was Chris Topher. and Topher two different names? Two separate Cr- names? Yeah, Chris and Topher. Like Topher Grace. Yeah, like Topher right. Grace. Uh, 85, I'd say. Yes. Okay. I can't believe Topher was a top 10 name. That's mad, isn't it? Yeah. Um, the price of a Swatch watch was 29 99 The price of a postage stamp was 22 cents. Swiss Miss Coca was 99 cents. And one ounce, one ounce of gold was $327. Sam, what year was that? 63? No. 95. Oh. Oh, cool. Wait, what, 75? No, it 85. was 85. 85. Swiss, oh, 85. don't you remember Swatch Watches, Sam? Uh, well, yeah, but how much was the price of it? Uh, $29. Oh, they weren't expensive then? Well, no, oh, but they weren't invented in 75. That's a fair amount of money in the 80s. Yeah. Uh, right, Chris. Uh, Where the Wild Things Are by Morris Sindaki and The Feminine Mystique by Betty Friedan were notable books from what year? His name is Morris Sendak. Sorry, I knew you'd know that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I didn't give you Do that. Do you know one. what year it is right. as well? Um, no, I'm not saying. 85. <laughs> no. Do you know what year it is, Sam? 63. Yeah, it's 63. I'd never get literary. <clears throat> uh, okay, if you're on, um, on the University Challenge, Sam, you'd have to do those. Yeah. yeah. Sam, the, pri- the cost of a Super Bowl ad was $525,000. Oh, it's ramping up. 43, 63, 75, 85. I mean, oh, that's really 85. cheap. 85. 85, yes. <laughs> uh, Chris, Pizza Uno created the first deep pan pizza. Sliced mm. bread was banned temporarily in the United States. 43, 63, 75, 85. Lunatics. Um, <laughs> I would say 75. No. It's got to be 43, hasn't it? Yeah, it was 43. Oh. Uh, okay then, Sam. The laser printer was invented. Betamax videotape was released. 43, 63, 75, 85. 75? Yes. 75? Yeah, that's 75. Yeah, because Betamax was dead by about 85, wasn't it? So Okay. Chris. Uh, Lawrence of Arabia. 43. Fo- 43? No. Yes, well, I've said it now. <laughs> 63. It was 63. Uh, okay, Sam. The price of a postage stamp was five cents. A turtle bowl, uh, sorry, a turtle kit, bowl, food, <laughs> ornament and gravel was 44 cents. And a turtle was 21 to 49 cents each. Wow. <laughs> what, what year? Why, where did you get the... I don't, I don't know. know this, turtle this, all this information is from one website and I don't know no, why right. they decided to put that as the... Like, uh, info. Four, 43. No, it wasn't 43. Uh, Chris. 75. Price of a, oh, what, you're not even going to let me oh, ask sorry, a question? No, I, I thought it was actually <laughs> the turtle one. <laughs> no. Uh, the price of a movie ticket was 30 cents, a gallon of gas was 15 cents, and the average price of a new car was $900. I should have written Four, all this down because I... 43. Had, I forgot what you said, yeah. 63, 75, 85. What was the car again? A grand? Nine hundred dollars, yeah. Um, probably sixty-three. No. Uh, okay, we're nearly at the end. What, here. what is it? You're not telling. That was me. that was forty-three. Oh. Uh, okay, Sam. A Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood. The Vampire Lestat by Anne Rice. Eighty-five. Yes, well done. Um. Chris, Mary, Barbara, Patricia, Linda, Carol, James, Robert, John, <coughs> William, Richard. 43, 65. Oh, no. Uh, Sam, Jennifer, Amy, Heather, Melissa, Angela, Michael, Jason, Chris, Topher, again, you James, and David. 75. Yes, it was 75. You know what's happened here, right? I think that the paradox is broken because now Alex has gone, in the future now Alex will go and he will, he will scrub out some of the rats <laughs> and change them. Yeah. Which is why Chris has done worse in the second half. And this of the quiz, quiz will never yeah. end. Yeah, no, I'll just keep going around. Uh, okay, last last one. I haven't been adding up, so I don't know where we are. Uh, I think I'm winning. Chris. No, I think I am. A Tree Grows in Brooklyn by Betty Smith. 43, 63, 75, 85. That nice. 
Is this me? It's you, yeah. Oh. 63? No, it was 43. See, with that, if you'd all just been writing down the, num- <laughs> the numbers, you could have kind of went, right, now I need Well, to I was doing up. a tally, but only of mine. Okay, that's fair enough. So, one. But you don't know who won? No, well, I don't, I don't know. Now. So we'll go back in time to work out yeah. who won. Okay. Right, if any listeners want to add that up and email us... <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm just adding it up now. Uh, oh, he's got. Oh, yeah, got the results. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm getting the results. Hold on. Right. I'm just they're coming in. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, Sam wins by two. It was yes. seven to five. It's all that book knowledge. Yeah, it was the books, wasn't it? He, he picked <laughs> you books, on the eh? books. Yeah. People yeah. always say that reading pays off, and there Damn. you go. That's there that's the go. one time Damn it's well paid off. Parents. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Well, back at predestination, uh, we are. So, Jane. I would much rather watch a film, right, where you are, have got a game show, Alex, about mm. time travelling, and you're going through time, like forcing people <laughs> to play your game show. <laughs> That'd be a great film. It could happen, couldn't it? Like I people in the past happen. having to do that quiz. Yeah, but he's like kidnapping them. To, like, come and do his quiz. Or I'd like to see Chris go back in time and have tons of kids and name them. Tofa just to import to change, results. Just to change <laughs> the result of that of that of that quiz so that he suddenly yeah. manipulates the answer. Or go and like rig rig the Oscars. Yeah. yeah. Rig- <laughs> no, no, go no, go back to nineteen forty three and and film Lawrence of Arabia. Yeah. yeah. Just so he gets released twenty right. years early. Yeah. yeah, that'd be great. Um back in the film, so Ethan Hawke has taken John, the unmarried mother, back to sixty three. Uh, so and he says the man that you want to kill will turn up in a minute, but it's a big lie, isn't it? Because actually, the John meets Jane, as in the male version of the character meets the female version of the character, and they fall yeah. in love. Which doesn't make any sense, though, does it? Does it? No, it doesn't really make any sense. Because has it? he never but, looked in a fucking mirror? Well, they like, do. They do say that they haven't that she didn't look in a mirror when she was young. No, but I, I mean, he, he hasn't looked in a mirror. Yeah, and he hasn't looked in a mirror either. I mean, I liked the idea that if you went back, you could, like, say the things to yourself that you know you want to hear. I like that idea. But, you, but I, do, you, do you think that you'd fall in love with yourself? Because I don't think I would do no, that. No, no, I don't think I would fall in love with myself. <laughs> as a, It sounds a bit gross to me. It is a bit gross. Um... But it's kind of like this is where the film has to go because they have to sit up, don't they? Like I can imagine like going back and being friends with myself and going like, oh, maybe don't go there or do this or, you know, mm. try and point myself in the right direction. But I wouldn't go as far as fucking myself. I think it's a bit... <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, that's... It's a bit uh, weird. Because if, yeah, ex- I mean, I, I think you've kind of hit the nail on the head in that if if it was that the female version was in love with the male version and then the male version just left and that fucked up her life... Yeah, it was like, I can't do this, this is too yeah. gross, yeah. It's the yeah. idea that they had sex that is a bit of... Consensually. Consensually, yeah. That's, actually in love with each other. Yeah, that's the kind of bit that is a bit hard to reconcile, Weird isn't stuff it? out there. Yeah, That's I guess. true. <laughs> um, so then Ethan Hawke goes back. Uh, where does he go? So he jumps to... It's a bit where he jumps to 1992. <laughs> For some reason, I've confused myself on where this is. Yeah, anyway, that's when he goes back to the temporal bureau. Bureau. Yes, yes, he does. And he, he, get, he gets out, doesn't he? At this point, is that yeah. right? He quits. Yes, and yes. goes back to live in the sixties. Is it? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Ethan Hawke. You see, Ethan Hawke talk to Noah Taylor, and Ethan Hawke jumps to the hospital, kidnaps the baby, and takes yes. it to 1945. Mm. Thus, kind of starting the loop and he also you see him talk to Noah Taylor and talk about I can't say it is it Arubus how do you say Arubus Arubus the snake that eats itself yes yeah um hold on there's the same story in uh, Red Dwarf isn't there I was yeah. thinking that is a, yeah I was thinking that Lister well. is that... basically the same as this yeah 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 he is the same as this yeah um and without a doubt that the, the... Guys, the Red Dwarf read this story, and this is where they ripped it off from. Isn't yeah, it? Oh, yeah. Right. it probably came out. Be- yeah, it came out before the film, obviously. So, oh yeah, they got yeah. That yeah. So, he- Ethan Hawke jumps back, picks up John, takes John to the temporal agency to become an agent, uh, and then yeah, Ethan Hawke kind of retires um, to nineteen seventy-five. 
Uh, no, he jumps to 75, doesn't he? Because he, he, th- the idea being that he kind of wants to solve the mystery of the Fizzle Bomber, doesn't he? He's kind of gone a bit rogue at this point, is, is kind of the implication. Um, well, haven't they really retired him, though? They yeah. decommission his box, don't they? Yes, but it doesn't decommission. His kit doesn't yeah. decommission, does it? God knows. Um, <laughs> and then he becomes the unmarried mother, which is a bit weird. He starts typewriting. And then yes. anyway, the, the, big, <laughs> the big twist is he, he works out a clue to do with a laundromat, walks into the laundromat and sees himself as a kind of long-haired, weird hippie, uh, old man. and The, the kind worst of, acting in the whole film. Y- yeah. Uh, <laughs> and it gets a bit kind of... It gets a bit... The, the dialogue here is a bit silly as well. It's the whole like, oh, if you shoot me, you become me. And like, you've got to him, love me. Everyone and... on Earth, on the planet, is him. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, and it, it's kind of this is where the kind of conspiracy theory element as well comes in because the Fizzle Bomber, although he's mad, seems to say that he's been not, not only has Noah Taylor been kind of allowing him to do that, but the people he's killed have saved more people because he's killed some people to save more people. Is that the, that yeah. was it, wasn't it? Mm. Um, but he's got a like really specific stats, doesn't he, about yeah that as well, which is strange. Yeah, yeah. And then it kind of ends, and we kind of realise that uh, Ethan Hawke is Jane, is John. They're all just one person, is the Fizzle yeah. Bomber. And it's all just a big time loop. Uh, and that's kind of the end. Um, and as Chris just said, Wikipedia puts the whole thing in chronological order. So if you've been very confused by this, my telling of this, or our telling of this, you can just go and look at it in actual date order, which makes it make a lot more sense. Mm. Um, it's also worth noting as well that the film does like literally just stop the way that like your description did mm. just kind of yeah. it just just goes to black almost mm. mid-sentence in a way that was yeah. like it kind of felt to me as though they'd like given up trying to explain it so just thought oh fuck it let's just end it here and well, it can be a, you know no, yeah yeah maybe I mean I think I, I read that they basically they stuck very closely to the story uh, right. and their explanation for that was that if it's a 50 year old narrative and if someone hasn't found a better way to say this, why change it? Do you know what I mean? Mm. So that's why they, so maybe the short story just cuts off there, but as you say in a story, that's, a, that's okay. But on but screen, that's an absurd thing to say because no one's been trying to rewrite this story for 50 years, have they? <laughs> what a stupid thing to say. It's not as if every book is just a rewrite of this book. Yeah. I guess they just, they couldn't think of a better way to do no, it. No, clearly they couldn't. No. Uh, but no. yes, well, it's it like isn't it gets to the ending. point where they think everyone's got it now. Got everyone. <laughs> everyone knows the story. Cut. Yeah, yeah. It is a bit abrupt, and it. But then, if it had gone on further, would it have been better? I don't know. Would you wanted to see more? I don't know. No, I don't think more necessarily. But I just think they just didn't reach a satisfactory conclusion mm. at all. You know. So, how did you feel overall, Chris? You saw this before, didn't you? Yeah. So on a second view, I mean, I, I you... remember when I after I first saw it, I went. I I was telling someone about it, and. I didn't care about spoilers. I was mm. I was spoiling it for them. Uh, I was I was like, and it turns out everyone in the film is the same person. <laughs> and to me, I just thought that was really clever because I've not yeah. seen that before. So mm. it did the trick. And you thought it was just as good the second time, or no, no. <laughs> it's like an M Night Shyamalan film. Oh, Only okay. works once. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So well, you know, I had you... I had the rush. I went on that roller coaster. Mm. <laughs> so you didn't think watching it again, it didn't make it better. It just made it. You no, just I know. As, as I said, twist. I was actually quite surprised at how much information they give you. But the thing is, you don't know. Like they actually show yeah. her face right at the very beginning, and yeah. as the bloke, as the man, and you're there going after one second view, and they're going, "Oh yeah," but obviously that wouldn't mean anything to you, like no. when you watched it the first time. I think it's quite cleverly... I think it's an impossible story to tell mm. in the sense mm. of, like I've said, how difficult it is to drip feed the right amount of information for your brain not to go, this is ridiculous. Like, why would you not know that? Why? Yeah. I mean, yeah, why is the barkeep's memory gone? Like, I just don't... Yeah. It just to make... Yeah. Anyway. No, it's the kind of thing when you start really trying to pick it apart, it, it doesn't really work. No. And maybe, like you said, on one viewing, just one viewing, you go, mm. oh, that was good. But if you you can't really revisit it, 
ironically, yeah. for a time travelling film. Um, Sam, what was your uh, opinion then? Um, yeah, I didn't really like it. It was all right. It was. It started all right, and it's you know the setting of it and the way it's told is quite different to other sort of time travel <laughs> stuff we've seen. But it does, as as Chris said, doesn't really work and like collapses in on itself in a mm. way that that really just sort of it just felt like they were kind of, kind of grasping around for a way to make to have an impact in the second half of the film and just failing to find something that that was um, you know like some big twist or some yeah. big climax. It just sort of keep, kept falling over itself and then just mm. like just sputtered out to nothing. It wasn't as neat um, as Time Crimes, was it really? No, and I think Time Crimes as well. Obviously, they've all got this problem that it is ridiculous. Like a, mm. a you know predestination paradox is absurd, um, and so I suppose what they've got to do is obscure it enough that you, you you're not um, you're not spending the time trying to unpick it. Yeah, and that's where this fell down for me. In the second half of this film, it, you can't help but unpick it because they're so blatant and upfront about constantly telling you all the different ways that this paradox is working. Mm. And you're like, well, it's just nonsense, but. Yeah, so, no. I'm glad I saw it, but mm. like, yeah, it was all right. How about you, Alex? Yeah, no, I enjoyed it, and I I thought it was a good story. And I think, but now, as the way Chris has said it, that if you watched it again, it would just kind of you'd be. I think yeah. I think that's exactly right. Is that you can only really watch this film once. If you watch it again, you're going to start trying to pick it apart or noticing things or analysing it, and actually, that would undo the film. We've already come up with more things that are problems about it than I did while I was watching it because I was caught up in the story. Uh, so it, sadly, I don't think it it, it, it warrants repeat viewing. Um, I think also from like a production side, it doesn't help it so cheap, but the makeup's mm. crap. And mm. a lot of this, you know, this, the scenes sort of are in like, you know, there's no like scale or anything to look at, is there? It's no. like watching a play, not a very good play. And like the music's forgettable. I can't remember anything from the score no, at all. No. It's all very, mm. you know... I think it's well done for what it is, and I'm, I'm, I think it's good that it's a faithful adaptation of that story. I think that's a good thing to do. But yeah, I think it's... Uh, and I do, as I say, the transgender issues are interesting, but I yeah. agree with you, it kind of undoes that by having the character turn into a mad, psychopathic mm. bomber, ultimately. That's not really... Well, and, well, and also a, a self-loving, yeah. strange narcissist yeah. who isn't really transgender because it's just this strange creation that yeah. doesn't... That can't exist. Yeah, you know, because they've had sex it's with them. Yeah, it's it's kind of themselves, undoing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's made it a uh, more of a. Uh, it's made it almost like more unreal because that is a real yeah, thing, yeah. and they've made it more unreal by saying, "Oh, mm. but it's only because a man version and a woman version of the same person have had sex that that's happened." Yeah. So I'm just yeah. trying to think if you if that actually happened, like two of the same person. Say it started off with two of this person, two people with the same genome. Mm. Hmm. Then you'd get like, you'd get the offspring. But I'm just saying, as it went through time, you'd get like a uh, genetic Mut- drift quite yeah. considerably, though. Or mutations. You? Like, it would you? be. Wouldn't the first one get like a six fingered freak one? Because like, you know, people who like sleep with their cousin end up with weird kids, don't they? Yeah. It would be. Yourself, yeah. It would be pretty. Yeah, pretty bad. I think. It's a, it's a st- statistical thing, though, isn't it? Like. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So where does it's funny it... though if like different shots through the film we kept like having a more mangled face, slightly more mangled yeah. as it kept going right around. Well <laughs> yeah. But also yeah. we don't know how many times this has happened, like Yeah. Or maybe the orphanage could just be filled with like him as different babies, just all but like more and more mutated versions of the same yeah. person. <laughs> yeah. Um weird. Well where does it go on the ranking? Who wants to go first? Hmm. What do we think? I think you should just watch the uh, Red Dwarf episode instead. That's my... Yeah, it's funny. It's exactly the same. To the listeners. What do we think? Around, I mean... I think, uh, to me, it's kind of midway round, mid-table. It's not bad. It's not perfect. I don't know. No? I mean, I'd (laughs) say around... Ooh, like... uh, Round edge of tomorrow. That's around fifty nine sixty. <laughs> it's always round edge of tomorrow. <laughs> it's always round edge of tomorrow. No, I would put it like um, I'll put that. before they get shit. Like around oh. the real steel Mad Max area. That's kind oh, of the, okay. That's the yeah. cusp for me. That area now. Fair enough. Real, real, 
I'd put it even lower than that. I'd put it um, one below Stargate. <laughs> oh, that's no, low. one above Stargate. Oh, that's low. It wasn't mm. good, was it? Actually, no, sorry. One better than safe, not guaranteed, because it's a better time travel film than that. <laughs> no. Where's that? No, no what fat dancer that? got his guitar out in this. Yeah. Mm. So, like, round 70... What's that, 76, 77? 76, yeah. 77. Mm. What do you say, Chris? 67? Yeah, uh, a few higher than that, I thought, about 70, something like that. And Alex, you think even higher than that? Yeah. Well, yeah, but I'm, I'm not that... I'm not that... Um, I don't think it's better than them, to be honest. I really like them. Um... And I, I guess around this sort of Mad Sunshine. Mad Max as well. It's like Mad Max was very I think original. Sunshine sort of area is a safe yes, area for yeah, it. Yeah, I agree. Mad Max is better than it though, isn't it? Though? Yeah, it's, yeah. No, round yeah. Sunshine, I agree. Sunshine? Yeah. Should we go... Oh, let's go above Sunshine. Yeah. 70. Excellent. 70. Well, there you go. That's the end of our uh, <coughs> time travel uh, reviews. Back five years. Brilliant. Yeah, it was a good concept. I think we should do it every year. Definitely, yeah. Way to start the year, yeah. Mm. But what's cool. next week? Do we have anything well, to cut to? We don't have to cut to. Uh, we discussed it. Was it last week we had the fan mail or the week before? When yeah. uh, Thomas wrote in about Doctor Who. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's his choice of film. Yeah, so next week we're watching Doctor Who and the Daleks, which is the first of two 1960s Doctor Who films starring Peter Cushing. Mm. And... Uh, well, in the meantime, you can go on our website, sciencefictionratingsystem.com. You can email us at sciencefictionratingsystem at gmail.com. And you can hit up Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, SF Rating System. Uh, I put a trailer for the new Waterworld, uh, massive Waterworld release coming up. <laughs> you can watch that and look at the, the exploded box pack and see all the free stuff you get with it if you're into Waterworld. Anyway, <laughs> it's goodbye from me, Alex Humphrey. <laughs> goodbye, Chris Redding. Goodbye. Goodbye, Sam Draper. Alice Clark. Bye.